Okay, good morning to everybody. I'm glad to see you there. Um, I would appreciate it if, uh, if, if for some reason you don't think you're seeing what you should see or you're not hearing well, please send me a chat. Uh, please send me um, a, um, or a comment. Um, I, I don't want to be talking if nobody can hear me. So um, I appreciate interruptions in this context. Um, I'm, a, I'm abusing the ch chair, as they say, and today I'm going to present myself, um, and I will be speaking myself. This is a subject that's, that's close, to, close to my heart. Um, it happens to be uh, very important in the area of where I live, so I shall, I shall get started on the talk. Uh, can you see that full screen? Yes, we did. Okay. Yes. Well, um, as, as an as an introduction, uh, my name is Dan Robison. I've been with uh, Future Generations, uh, first graduate school, then university, since uh, its first cohort since 2004. And all that time, I uh, most of that time, I was sharing the job with my wife Sheila who passed away in 2013. But all this time we have been based in the tropical part of Bolivia. And um, we have been part-time, generally speaking, with the university and um, are involved with, with different activities at the local level. And one of the most uh, important activities has been working um, uh, to try to discourage the building of, of, of mega dams in our part of the uh, country and our part of the Amazon. Um, as you will see, uh, this, this the topic was not one that I would have thought that I would write about uh, even two years ago, but um, we're having a considerable success um, in resisting this, uh, this, this idea. And it's really, in, in good measure, um, uh, related to, related to, hello? In good measure, in good measure, it's related to the fact that almost everybody now has smartphones and everybody is using social media. So the subject of my talk today is outside in support for indigenous communities facing government imposed mega dams in tropical Bolivia and the age of social media. And I think that some of the lessons that we've learned can work for other issues, not just dams, uh, but uh, for other issues where local people, indigenous people, minorities may be at a disadvantage when uh, trying to uh, resist against uh, uh, what they consider to be a bad idea. I'm going to give a little deep history. Um, first, until 1980, dams were considered a universally good idea. They were considered, it was considered to be progress. You would build dams. You had energy. Um, you controlled flooding. And they were just, they were just considered to be one of the best signs of civilization and this was true in the western world in the united states many big dams were built it was particularly true of eastern bloc countries uh, the soviet union set out to build many dams and um it was just a, a an important sign of progress and prosperity however my undergraduate degree uh, in the in, in the united states in kansas was soil and water degree in soil and water conservation, and already in 1980 there was official skepticism. Skepticism, in other words, my teachers were already uh, very uh, clear that there were many, many unexpected, unintended consequences with dams. And just quickly, 
the most famous bad idea dam was the Aswan Dam on the Nile. It was supposed to control the flooding on the Nile, uh, which it did. But then it surfaced that that uh, this flooding was a key to the thousands of years of sustainable management of the soils downstream from the Nile. And all of a sudden, they weren't getting the sediments. Um, the, the, the dam was supposed to last a long time, and it filled with sediment very, sediments very quickly. So all of a sudden, they lost a lot of its capacity to, to, to work. Um, in the states, you have the, you have, we studied the case of the Colorado River, which is a, uh, used to be a very big river that would run through western United States and, and into to Colorado. But, but up, until, uh, up until 1980, in the last century, the U.S. had built so many dams that they were using up all the water. And when it got to Mexico, it was a little trickle. It wasn't a big river. It was a trickle. Um, and also, though, though people discuss now climate change as a new topic, I got it, I was taught it, I, I studied it um, 45 years ago. It was, it was um, a, a topic of analysis, and it included topics such as desertification, greenhouse gas effect, deforestation, conversion of natural land to farmland and farmland to urban land. These are issues we've been talking about for a long time. And the dams were, were considered, were a, a minority of people particularly interested in the subject realized that dams were not contributing to this global, uh, to the global environment. Um, in 1985, you had the phenomenon of International Rivers Network, Bank Watch, Bank Watch is a reference to uh, up until that time and for a few years more, the World Bank, one of their main businesses, was providing funds to build uh, dams. And so you had these are organizations that grew up to resist the idea of 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 um, of building large dams and of and of uh, um, affecting the, the the large river dynamics around the world. Um, by, two, by the year 2000, the World Bank was no longer in the dam business. They were no longer giving money. And, um, so, uh, but there were other people, and especially recently, other, other organizations, especially the, the Chinese government, national government, is funding dams. But in this, in this history of dams, it was, it was known that tropical dams in particular are bad ideas. You have a lot of vegetation. Um, there's a lot of organic matter in that vegetation, in the soils, and when you flood that land, you're actually contributing to, uh, to greenhouse gases. Um, and, and so some, some energy generated with tropical rivers is actually dirtier in terms of carbon than a coal-powered plant. So these are, these are things that we understood, those of us that worked in the, in the topic understood this, but most governments still tried, had amongst their aspirations, building large dams. So um, in 1999, um, the, the, the government of Bolivia start, it was a right-wing government at that time, it started to push the idea of of uh, dams in Bala and Chepete on the Beni River. This is for, close to where I live. And it was an old idea in the 1950s, the Bala Gorge, where these two men are standing, had been identified as having a huge hydro potential. Um, that's because the energy you can generate with hydro, with water, is proportional to the amount of water that is flowing and the height that you drop it or what's called the head. And so this is a huge uh, river. It's about the size of the Mississippi River. Um, it drains a good part of the Bolivian uh, Andes. Um, and you, the, 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 the gorges there apparently had a, the potential of being able to raise the water a very high level to drop it. Um, essentially, when they were talking about it in 1999, um, what they were proposing was four times the energy that Bolivia 
consumed as a country at that time. In other words, they were they were planning to multiply by four the amount of energy electric energy generated in the country, and the idea was to sell it to Brazil. And so they brought in a U.S. expert called Greg Morris. And um, what you can see here in the light gray was the original concept, a huge dam in Bala, in the Bala Canyon, which I'll show you pictures of a little bit later. And it would, it would flood a very large area, 400,000 uh, hectares. And it was known that flooding a large area of land is bad for the proportional to the amount. So every meter that you'd raise, every meter that you'd raise the dam, you would have to raise the water a meter in all this area. So what Morris came through, he said, no, what you've got all these mountains here. You, what you need to do is have two dams, a dam at the Bala and a dam at the Chepete. And so what's dark black was, was what he considered to be the, uh, um, the improved version with two dams. Um, the cost was estimated at $4 billion. I'm going to have to let the cat out. Otherwise, he's not going to. Okay, the cost was estimated at $4 billion. The idea was to sell the energy to Brazil, but in the southeastern part of the country, which is over four, over 1,000 kilometers away. And the transmission was set to nearly double the cost. And it was estimated to take seven years to build, seven years to fill. So in this 1990-2000 experience, uh, Brazil was supposed to fund it, but Brazil wasn't interested in funding it or buying the energy. A Chinese company was interested in building it, but nobody wanted to fund it. But what, what was relevant to what I'm talking about now is that basically four people were seen to be against the idea, including the Gringo Robinson, which is uh, how some of the people refer to me in Bolivia. Gringo means uh, foreigner uh, or can also be synonymous with somebody from the United States. Um, there were a few of us, uh, we were considered to be against progress for the Amazonian part of Bolivia. And most of, most of the opposition that we expressed was the idea that you would be flooding major parts of two world-class national parks. And fortunately, the idea fell of its own weight. In other words, nothing happened because nobody was going to fund it. Um, so, so the idea went away for a while, but, um, in, in 2006, uh, Evo Morales came to power. He was the first indigenous president in the Western hemisphere. And very quickly, the country came to depend on natural gas and, uh, petroleum derivative exports. And so you can see the lines here, um, this peak was about 2007, 2008, before the world economy gave a drop. Um, and then you can see that over the next years, the amount of money that the country was getting was quite large. But by 2015, it was dropping. And the reason for that is Bolivia no longer has much gas. No new fields were found. Um, and, uh, and the national price was, was dropping. So the government, in my opinion, had gotten accustomed to having this um, reliable income stream that came in at one point. In other words, they had one buyer in, in, in Argentina, one buyer in, in, in Brazil, and all that money went directly to the government. Um, so as that money was dropping, they were looking around, you know, what other things can we do to generate um, instead of taxing people, what other things can we do to generate large amounts of money and that it come directly to the government? Um, and uh, so they started to talk, uh, talk about dams, not just the two dams I'm talking about, but four or five dams. This was going to be the solution. Bolivia was going to generate energy 
uh, for the neighbors. It was going to become a hub of energy generation. Now, I should mention that, that in that time, in 2009, Bolivia got a new constitution, and it changed its name from Republic to the Plurinational State of Bolivia. And the Plurinational State of Bolivia uh, was a reference to 36 indigenous groups in the country, indigenous uh, languages. And the idea was under this new constitution, uh, these indigenous, these 36 indigenous groups would have greater or have greater expressed rights. However, in practice, and there's, there's this picture down here, in 2011, the government continued to insist on building a new highway through a national park in indigenous territory. And so the inhabitants of that territory marched on La Paz. And this is, at, before they got to the city, they were repressed. The government came in and violently stopped the march. And so this is the government is basically beating up on indigenous people for protecting their own rights. So, so in theory, the Constitution uh, provided all these new rights for indigenous people, but in reality, the government was, was uh, basically doing what they wanted to do. And if an, if an indigenous group uh, showed um, uh, resistance, what they commonly do, and this is, this is, broad, this is well recognized, is they would split the indigenous organization would work with the part of the organization that wanted to work with the government, did thereby debilitating. So this is the context of um, context behind the government starts to talk about the dam again. Uh, indigenous groups are split, and uh, so how do we how do we face the this threat? Um, this is the Chepete Dam site. This is the upper dam, which would be the main dam. It has national park on both sides. On the right is uh, Medidi National Park, and on the left is Pilon Lajas Biosphere Reserve. Medidi National Park is the most biodiverse park in the world. Uh, it has 1,028 species of birds, which is one out of eight birds in the world in the, occur in this national park. Um, and the government was ready to flood it. This is a... A, a, a view of the Bala, of the gorge where the Bala Dam would be built. Um, again, you can see these are mid-range mountains, but throw, flowing past them, these very large rivers. Now, this is a, this is a, I'm not very good at map making. This is a map I've made, um, and I'm partially colorblind, so the colors are always make people smile. But anyway, we have just goodness gracious. If it's not a rooster, it's a cat. Um, so you have uh, the Pilon Lajas Biosphere Reserve here. You have a part of Medidi National Park uh, with the yellow outlines, okay? And so the Chepete Dam would be here and would flood this area of light blue here. And then these yellow dots are the community would be flooded. That's in the upper dam. And then you have a, a Bala down here with the fewer number of, of communities flooded. But you also have indigenous territories. You have the ethnic group Blecos. You have uh, the Uchupiamonas. You have Tacanas, Chimanes, and, and Mosetenes. So there are five indigenous territories in addition to the two national parks that would be affected. Um, the official name of the Chepete Dam is Chepete 400, which means they would flood to the to the elevation of 400 meters above level. And so, uh, as you can see, it's mountainous terrain. There are lots of places where you could build a dam. But in this area here, where, the, where there would be the flooding, which you can see here, 
there are a lot of communities and it's a very fertile area of the country. So the, the impacts of the Chipeta Dam would be direct flooding to the Medidi National Park, Bilo Nahas Biosphere Reserve, four, four indigenous territories, 59 communities flooded. It's the most fertile tropical soils in the country. It's an area with a, a chocolate cooperative that pioneered certified organic chocolate around the world. It's also an area of considerable gold mining activities. Um, the government, in estimating the cost, did not take into account the, the, what people were do, doing, what their livelihoods do. They did not take. They have not taken into account what the total cost, uh, of what with the finance, the social and environmental costs, and for some reason, and this is a repeating situation, they are not interested in considering alternatives. Um, so, are, are there alternatives? We think there are. Um, just a quick picture of some of the fruit that's produced in this in the area that would be flooded. Um, it's one of the main areas that provides the city of La Paz and the Highland Andes with tropical fruit. Um, it's an area that I grew up in as a child, so it's, it's, it's long been known as a fertile part of the country. Um, and then the Bala Dam was, uh, is expected to, to, to flood a smaller area because it's considered to be a run of the river. In other words, it's not, gonna, it's not going to detain a lot of water it's simply going to generate water uh, with, with what comes by and the Chepete Dam, which is higher on the river, would be the one to regulate the water. Um, in, the, in, in the information and in the studies, they hired an Italian company to do studies, which they, the results of which they've kept secret, but which we've gotten, uh, we, have the, we have the information. The, the uh, river, the energy that would be generated here would be quite expensive and would only come online in about 2040. Um, I'll, I need to, to move along here. Um, the principal concern, because of the resistance in 99 and 2000, the principal concern of the government was to show that with the new dam proposals, they would be flooding a uh, smaller part of the national parks. And so this is a this is a government presentation slide showing that very, that less of the of the national parks would be flooded, but no attention was paid to communities, and communities were told that they, it was known what communities would be flooded or not, which is false because a, a dam is flooded to a certain elevation, and you can take a topological map and see what communities what land is below four thousand four 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 hundred meters. What's the social impact? It's a very complicated social situation. The area that would be impacted is in two departments. Those, these are major political divisions in the country, four municipalities, and we have four ethnic groups, Jiman, Moseten, Takana, and Leko. And each of these ethnic groups has their own uh, social organization. They have their own structure through which they through which they negotiate with the government. And the, the Beni River comes right down through the middle of all this. And there's no organization that represents all of the indigenous people in this area. So they have, the local communities created the Mancomunidad, which in English is the Commonwealth of Communities of the Beni River. And the government doesn't recognize this organization. But in the, these indigenous communities within the area that would be flooded have three sustainable livelihoods, traditional farming, hunting, and gathering, um, commercial fishing and farming on a small scale, and ecotourism. And um, an important difference with 1999 and 2000 was that in the lower part of the area, uh, people had continued to keep the idea alive. So by, by 2015, 2016, the population was much better informed than 1999. It wasn't just four people, it was, there were a lot of people. Um, here's a slide to reflect the ecotourism that's on in the area. 
As I said, it's the most, the Madidi is the most biodiverse park in the world. We have 20 years of sustainable community owned and community led tourism, and it's the main motor for the regional economy. So when the government started to propose the idea again, it met a very different situation. There were no longer just four people, including the Gringo Robinson. But from my point of view, I have this conundrum. Even though I'm born in Bolivia and I'm a Bolivian, um, I will always be considered. I look like I'm from the States. I guess I dress like I'm from the States. Um, and around the world, people outside the United States do not want people from the U.S. telling them what to do with their resources. So if, if Trump, for example, comes along and tells Venezuela to not to use their oil one way, to use it another way, people don't like that. And there may be, they may be likely to use it. Whatever Trump says, they're going to do the opposite. And it wasn't just Trump. It was Obama. It was basically, it doesn't help for somebody from Europe or from somebody from the U.S. to tell people how they should be using their resources. So how can somebody who will always be considered an outsider help? So in the meantime, 2006 to 2013, I was again the face of resistance to a bridge that the government wanted to build through the middle of the town of Zuzhnevake. This is the town where I live, and the government wanted to build a bridge right through the middle of town and along a geological fault there instead of building it downstream, which would have been more, much more expensive, but uh, safer considering uh, the amount of flooding that we get the size of the river. Um, in that process, the government actually used my process as an excuse. In other words, they would say, oh, you're just repeating Dan Robison's idea. And his ideas come directly from the U.S. Embassy, which is laughable because, uh, uh, you know, the U.S. Embassy doesn't even know I'm alive. Um, and it was an excuse for the government to, res to, for the government to not respect a majority. So there's a mistake there, to not respect the majority of the viewpoint. In other words, a majority of the people were against the dam, but they said, oh, that's just Dan Robinson's idea. So how have we done things differently this time? First, um, when they started to talk about the Bala Dam again, a younger generation came to look for me. Okay, these are, these are three uh, leaders, urban leaders from the town where I live um, that are a generation younger. They came. And what we agreed was that it was not convenient for me to be the face of anything. So uh, young urban men and women organized the co coordinator for the defense of the Amazon. This is a new organization. And within the days, the next day or two days, they had a Facebook page. And then all of a sudden, they were connected with universities and activists nationally. In other words, there were people in La Paz, there were people in other parts of the countries, including inside universities, that wanted, they were against the idea, but they didn't have a way to connect with local people, okay? And all, within days, you have people talking on Facebook, okay? The other thing was that the Commonwealth of Communities of the Benny River was revived. So these are all indigenous men, and there, there's a, an indigenous woman I'll talk about later. But they revised this, this organization, and we all agreed that they are to be considered the owners of the territory. They're the ones that live there. They're the owners. So my role and the role of the urban people in the town is to help them defend their rights. This is not something we're doing for them. We're not telling them what to do. They have decided they want to defend themselves, and we are helping them. So this is a face, this is a Facebook page that uh, showed up two days after the organization on the ground was developed. I'm not going to go into detail here because um, uh, I'm mainly interested in talking about how it works. Those two that the local urban organization and the Commonwealth mobilized communities. They uh, they they had an assembly on the river brought people in from all the communities and they met and the communities exchanged ideas and they signed a declaration and gave the government an ultimatum 
to share the existing studies because there were studies already uh, completed and the government to this day, this was two years ago, and the government continues to refuse to share these studies. And so you can see they're, they've, they've, by now they're coming up with their bows and arrows and other signs of their indigenous background. In my case, um, I uh, uh, refined my blogging. I, I blog, and so my role in this, in my role in this process, I have interpreted to be uh, what's what I what's referred to as the long read. In other words, you're not writing uh, talking points. You're writing longer documents of analysis, and you're assuming that local people are going to read those documents that local people are interested in knowing the history and the and the and the background so i have written blogs this is one where i look at the the history of the idea the analysis from different points of view mapping what communities would be below water and of course this is all smartphone accessible so basically anybody with a smartphone in the area which is probably 95% of the adults can get this information and then we'd ask the questions, what are the real benefits? Who benefits? What are the financial, social, and environmental costs? Who pays the costs? What's the cost-benefit ratio? So again, we're not, we're, not, we're not just giving people talking points that they're to pair it out. We're, we are providing um, basic evidence and people can draw the conclusions. And one of the things that we discuss is, are there alternative ways to generate the electricity for a similar price, but with lower and social and environmental costs? This is another blog. Um, the title is Mega Dams at Balanchepete, the process of consultation in the plurinational state to impose a sacred cow that supposedly begs, lays golden eggs. Okay, Bolivia is a signatory to international treaties. There are laws, there's the constitution, which state that before you affect indigenous territory, you have to consult them first. So, so this is known in general, but this blog laid out the laws, laid out the, the uh, treaty, and compared what the government was doing with what was actually happening on the ground. So again, it's a long read. It's not a short document. It's a long read. But each of these blogs has had, that had between... 10,000 and 15,000 hits. In other words, people have downloaded them between 10,000 and 15,000 times, which is a large number in Bolivia. I also analyzed and mapped, again, a poor map. Here is the dam here. And most people look at what would happen to the people that are flooded in the immediate dams, but, I, uh, but I'm documenting what could be the impact downriver. There are another 59 communities. You'd be changing a, a, to which these 59 communities to a large extent live from fishing. You know, what, was, what will happen if you change the river dynamics? If it no longer floods, will the fish repopulate? Um, most of the evidence from other countries is that it will be heavily impacted. This is uh, the landscape downriver. It's a uh, meandering rivers. Um, full of fish, but it's assumed, it's known that these, that these uh, different oxbow lakes and meanders are important for the fish population dynamics. So if you dam the river, you know, how are you going to affect the fishing? What's the value of the fishing? Is, that, is, the, is the lost fishing a cost taken into account when you build the dam? There's another uh, important activity down river, which are natural savannas with cattle ranching. About two thirds of the cattle in Bolivia are raised in these natural tropical savannas. And they depend on fluctuation of the rivers. In the dry season, um, they, the, in the wet season, they go to the higher land and the lower land is flooded. In the dry season, there's no longer any rain, but the waters recede and the cattle and horses go into the lower and eat the grass in the lower areas that were underwater in the dry season. So what what would happen to this, this uh, important uh, livelihood? Also, what's the potential of tourism? This is a, this is a macaw that's endemic to that part of, of, the, of Bolivia. It's not even all of Bolivia. It's just one part of Bolivia, and it's downstream from the river. Um, what, 
what, how do you estimate the lost income from sustainable ecotourism? And finally, in terms of blogging, this is, a, this is an indigenous woman I've known for, for 25 years. Uh, and this is a picture of her at the United Nations where she is denouncing the president of Bolivia, who's also indigenous. She's denouncing them on the United Nations for violating um, uh, indigenous rights. And so this, was, this went down very badly with the government. And so they started to attack her. They started to, to, to um, um, freeze her bank accounts. They started to, to go after her with the taxes because she has a, she's an, she's a, she's a businesswoman. She, uh, her business is bird, uh, high level bird ecotourism. And so, um, she's, she's been successful. Um, she speaks English. She has a visa to the United States, which is why she could go to talk to the, go to talk to the United Nations. But it, I was able to write about her in a way that, that people can't write about themselves as an, as, as an outsider. In these cases, it's an advantage for me to be writing about another group. Of course, um, you, you write a blog, it's well received, it's a long read, so people are looking at the deeper subjects, but then that replicates. This is a Facebook page, this is the same person who uh, is, um, is, her activism and her ideas are being spread through social media. Now, alternatives. In Bolivia, we have a huge potential of wind energy in the high Andes. Uh, we have a huge potential of solar. We've got large areas which are semi-arid. We have the high altitude, receive a lot of solar radiation. Um, Chile recently uh, um, had a big national solar project and they, they, they put it up for bid and a French company won the bid and they are, they are the bid, they're producing energy for Chile at $27 a megawatt hour. This is roughly half the cost of what the, of the Chepete Dam and about a third of the cost of the Bala Dam. So our neighboring countries are already producing at half the cost um, alternative energy. And Bolivia has a small scale hydro, a huge small scale hydro potential. So again, you write, I've got blogged on this. What are the financial, environmental, social costs? Who benefits? Who pays? Are there alternatives that cost the same in financial terms but have lower social and environmental costs? In other words, when you when you when you generate with wind and solar, it turns out you can generate it for a similar price, but you're not flooding any national parks. You're not flooding indigenous territories. You're not flooding breadbaskets, and so. Um, the, the, these historically, these costs have not been taken into account. And we come back to the question is, there are alternatives, but why does the government not want to consider these? In my own opinion, is that they want this single source, single stream of income. In other words, solar is spread out, uh, wind would be spread out, and so it might create more employment but the income from that might be more dispersed and more undependable. They want a single source of income, like a pipeline with gas, and they imagine that hydropower would be that concentrated energy. Okay, this is my last slide. Um, reflections and conclusions. We seem to be winning. The government has backed off. The prospects are farther away. Now, what did we, what, what, can we look at to find out what were elements of success there? New faces, indigenous faces, and these, these people were not just repeating talking points. They're, 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 they, are, they are expressing their own informed opinions. What can be the outsider role? And unfortunately, the definition of outsider is how people view you, not how you view yourself. I may regard myself as a long-term inhabitant of that area, but I will always be, be uh, viewed as an outsider and it's important to keep that in mind. Uh, my role is to have up-to-date analysis, to share freely, available on smartphones, provide an evidence-based argument, 
blog, the quote, long read, not sound bites or talking points. It helps to take good photographs, okay? But these, and, and I think that this is important for everybody else out there, okay? I'm convinced that there are critical thinkers at most levels of cultures. In other words, critical thinking is not necessarily a function of education. So you have on the ground that are critical thinkers. They question if somebody, if the government comes and proposes things, people uh, question them and they have a right to have good information. And um, they, have, they have a right to express their own views. So you need to provide accurate information. Um, and it's just very different in the context with smartphones. Smartphones now are almost universal. Um, something happens and there's instant, people are instantly aware. Um, you can share ideas. There's an active back and forth. People are connected. Indigenous people are connected to urban people. Urban people in the Amazon are connected to people in the capital. Um, and even to people overseas. So um, it's a very different context. And I will just leave you with the idea that what I, what I aim for is a network of critical thinkers with smartphones. In other words, that's my audience. When I'm writing, I'm saying I don't, I don't, I'm not interested in the educational level. I'm interested in the critical thinkers out there that are asking questions. So, are there any questions? Hello. Kwang, good morning. Yeah, good uh, I'd like to ask, um, yeah, we also have a lot of problems with the dams in Vietnam and, uh, and uh, we are part of the uh, greater Mekong subregion. And um, it's an international river, and the context is a little bit different than uh, and, and the end of Colombia. But uh, we also have a lot of problems with uh, with the dams. I wonder if um, if uh, the land uh, in 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 your place is uh, owned by the government or it's a private land. Can uh, do people, um, do farmers have uh, ownership of land? Over yes. Um, most of the people flooded in the upstream from the Chipete Dam, where they produced the chocolate and the fruit for La Paz and for the world. Those are colonists that they, they, they entered the area perhaps 50 years ago, and they, are, are, they have private ownerships. But the government has not told them. The government tells them when they meet with them that they don't know which communities are going to be flooded. And we, and you know very well because because uh, you you do all your calculations on the dam based on the elevation that you're going to flood. And so the people in the upper part of that dam area do own the land, but they're not very well informed. Okay, um, in the middle in, in the middle part of the area, there are large indigenous territories and that land is owned they have a title to that land so and there are many many national international and national international treaties and national laws which give indigenous people rights over their land and in the case of bolivia um, 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 they have legal title to it even so i showed that picture of the police beating up on an indigenous person this was an indigenous person trying to defend their the land to which they have legal title. So a long answer to your question, but yes, uh, the land is either in uh, national parks or private small small landholders downstream. There are cattle ranchers that own the land, and then the large indigenous territories. Yeah, in that case, uh, it's easier for local people to fight against the dams. In my country, uh, the land is owned by the government, and the government uh, can easily uh, uh, move uh, population and people away and uh, did some uh, compensations, which is uh, which is uh, normally uh, do not, uh, you know, sufficient uh, to. Uh, 
for for people to recover from uh, from the damages uh, from the uh, uh, compulsory uh, migration. So in our place, uh, we try to mobilize uh, villagers to monitor uh, compensation schemes and resettlement programs. So um, it's not really the same as your place. Yeah. Right. It's, it's, a, it's a very different context, obviously. But I would argue in your context, you still have alternatives. And so an important thing is not just to fight the government on the ground, on the, on the land, but to fight with the ideas of alternative energy and to demonstrate that there are other ways of generating in, uh, energy that don't involve uh, flooding large, large areas. And I suppose in the Mekong Delta, to try to convince people that, that stopping the flooding is a good thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. The, uh, the problem is uh, the cost of alternative energy uh, at present uh, is uh, still uh, pretty high compared to hydropower. So uh, it's still uh, arguable for many developers. So they can make profits much better with uh, hydropower. Same with the government planners. They also think that way. Any other questions, Dan? Dan, uh, Dan this is Daniel. Um, really an inspiring statement of your conviction and um, doing the right thing and persistence across years. I want to pick up on Kwong's last point about making money. Um, on these sorts of projects, the real problem is from the short-term profits, as I'm understanding what you're saying. It's not the long-term profits. You've questioned the economic viability of the long-term viability of the dam and the alternative losses. But if I just want to put it out simply, some people are making a lot of money from building the dam and they, and then they'll be up and gone. I mean, the, the real financial problem is short-term gain, bribes to make that happen, and contractors who want to build something and move on to the next project. Is that the financial problem? I gather I didn't come through. That, that was directed at you. Um, the, I, I, from what I understand, Daniel, is that in, in Vietnam and, and in, the, in the Mekong Delta, it's also, I believe, uh, Laos is in the same situation. The governments have decided that hydropower is a major way to, to earn money there. And at, and in, in their context, and I, I would argue that probably it's changed because as I've been talking about the changing context of, of social media and the ability for people around the world to communicate in an instant on a smartphone, the, the costs of alternative energy is all, have also been dropping. But then Bolivia has huge elevation changes. It's got deserts. It's got high altitude deserts. It's got, uh, all, all, it has large swaths of, of, of land that Vietnam, uh, of, 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 of kind of environmental situations that Vietnam does not have. It has a greater area and a tenth the population. So in that sense, it's, it has, uh, a number of alternatives, but uh, but Quang, did you did you get Daniel's question? Anybody else uh, from Vietnam uh, want to answer that? I think Go the ahead. problem is more more complicated because uh, we are at the end of the road, and if we really want to talk about the damn problem. We have to sit there with many countries. It's not like just a group of people. So um, I think that is the main problem. Even though uh, the system of the antenna till like, we can have the wind and also the solar in the countryside, we have some uh, windmills like in some parts of the country. But it's just like like really small project for a small area. Uh, it's really hard to be the replacement for, you know, like the dependence on the dams. 
but the dams causing uh, Hayes Court quite a lot of problems right now, and people on top about disaster instead of talking about like how we we can erase that. Most of the contractor will be from China or from other country, and of course they just like come and and go. But it's not on. Um, it's not in Vietnam only. It's like from the upstream down to Vietnam, into like so many other countries too. So it's not a question for one country. I think that's make the problem more complicated. <clears throat> well, absolutely. We have uh, Wei Ling Yu on this call as well, and she's working at the headwaters of the Mekong River um, with the big national park up there. Um, and Wei Ling is, uh, also dealing with many of these problems at the at the start of the Mekong River, um, and the, the the my question I think was confusing, and I apologize for the confusion. It was basically a question of the short term versus the long term rationale, um, and um, the in my experience, in almost every country, the problems come from those people who are thinking in a short term perspective uh, and making significant profits. And um, the pro it's very hard to fight that because they're willing to do all sorts of things, uh, legal and um, not legal. D Dan, I'll let me follow up on your comment because obviously you have more experience than I do, but I think your question is very similar to the one I was gonna ask. I was just gonna be a little more blunt in terms of Dan had talked a lot in his presentation about kind of institutional corruption and with how the government set up he at least implied it um and i'm thinking of you know blatant corruption on the part of politicians and government uh, officials inspectors certainly in our work in northeastern india i think what you mean by the short term is when you have a politician and especially in that case it's a, it's a, and i'm so sure it's similar to democracy where you have a couple people who are in a position for three to five years and are going to great effort to approve a project that's not even going to begin for seven years. And, and, and literally the big buyouts, the bribes and everything came up front and the politicians and government and everybody who inherits the problem um, after the money's gone, um, or at least after the really um, easy money. Um, is, is that kind of the cycle you're referring to? Yeah, and I think the-, the yeah, just, I'm sorry. Shirzai has been Shirzai has been trying to talk. Uh, Shirzai, please. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Robinson. Uh, actually, this was the most interesting uh, topic for me, and I enjoy a lot. Uh, I think the issue of displacement, particularly due to development project, is a kind of a kind of an issue in all 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 in most of the countries. When I see the list of the development project, the construction of uh, hydro dam is in the top of all development projects that cause a lot of displacement, particularly in the South Asian countries. But these countries have a compensation policies. For example, if they lose land or if it creates a displacement, the government provides them, them with, a, with a very good package of compensations in order to reintegrate these people in the other areas. So my question is, what is the displacement situation in your countries? For example, uh, it's only up above the development, uh, the development uh, projects, due to development projects. And what is the compensation policy over? Well, in, in, the, case of, in the case of Bolivia, uh, um, the impression is that it's an empty country, that there's a lot of land available. But the areas that they want to flood are both some of the most biodiverse in the world and when they're in a park. And, uh, and the communities uh, are on very fertile land, which provides a, a good service. So when you talk about displacement, um, you, know, or, you know, you can't, you can't put, you can't set up that park in another place and generate biodiversity in another place and in the in the case of the humans you can't move them there they they are they are prospering there because of the soils so if you move them anywhere there can be space 
but you don't have the same um, the same uh, context for them to produce. Uh, Kwong alluded to something similar, you know, that they might compensate people, but it's never enough. In this case, they're putting you in a different ecosystem and they're not taking into account the cost of withdrawing an ecosystem from productivity when they build a large dam, because you're basically, you're saying that forevermore, this ecosystem will no longer provide the services that it used to provide. That cost is not being taken into account. Now I wanted to come to make a brief comment back about the very different context in in Vietnam. You know, I, I know it's a very different context. On top of that, that you're you've got several countries uh, sharing the river and decisions that are made upstream affect you downstream and so forth. Mm -hmm. But I would argue that now that there are smartphones and social media, that that situation, which was always complicated is now made easier. In other ways, you need to develop ways to communicate with other critical thinkers in the other countries. And those means, you know, I realize in particularly with China, it's difficult to communicate um, with other countries. You know, they, don't have the, they don't have the same social media, they don't share that. But there are ways that we have now for communicating at the grassroots level that we didn't used to have. Any other questions or comments? We're, we're at the top of the hour. Sure. Dan, Dan I think that uh, Wailing Yu had a question in the chat. Okay. She said, how do you... Uh, good morning. Good morning, Wailing. Uh, do you see it there? Oh, yes. How, how well the local the local people again again I, I'm 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 I am in a in an area where the government is trying to control what's said at the local level but they're not very efficient so I can go into a community and speak and nothing was going to happen to me or my colleagues that don't look like me can travel around and can speak um, what's happened is the government's doing things like. Uh, providing electricity to the communities that would eventually have to vote. So they have, they have built a road and put in 24 hour electricity to certain communities that didn't have it before. And they haven't provided that same surface to other communities that are not, that are not related to the dam. So how do you let the, how do you let the government, the, the local people, um, it's a question of getting good information, not, not scare information, but, but basic information you get the local people. To the government, it's more difficult. In this case, in the case of Bolivia, once we were on social media, we were able to connect with university researchers in La Paz that also feel kind of isolated. So when the local people and university researchers are connected on the same platform, then the government has to kind of listen. But I don't think that there's any one um, uh, and the government pretends that it's not listening, but we see evidence that we see evidence that 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 they're taking our our opinion into account much more than they did 18 years ago. Um, so uh, you know how that how that can be relevant in China and how, but I would say that in China, within China, you still have tools for mass communication that you didn't have 20 years ago. I don't know if that answers your question, Wei Okay. Any other questions? I'd like to uh, make a comment here. Uh, for example, I, I agree that uh, smartphone is becoming a very popular uh, and uh, important uh, communication tool for for uh, population for people to use uh, in negotiating with uh, the government with uh, them developers um, also to exchange information to share ideas and thoughts but uh, uh, there's a lot of also uh, challenges for using um, uh, social media, smartphones, 
the, for example, the language barriers are still there. Um, the access to um, internet is uh, also a critical problem in many uh, areas where dams are being. Normally they are in mountains. So access to internet is also a challenge. And also uh, cost of internet is, um, is also there. Um, also in terms of gender, we have a um, gender uh, gap you know, between um, men and women, and women may have uh, much less voice in the, in the um, discussions about them's impacts. So, uh, but, but I do agree that uh, smartphone, internet technology is becoming more and more important uh, instrument for uh, population to use. Yeah, in the negotiation with uh, the developers and the government. Yeah, and I, I, you know, it's difficult to, to, to draw much from what I've talked about from this particular experience to other contexts, except that I am, I repeat, I am convinced that there are critical thinkers at all levels and that, that you can connect them. You can, you can, you can be thinking when you're writing, uh, you can be thinking about those critical thinkers. Um, and try to write as clearly as possible. Now, in our case, we have a single language. Um, the 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 internet, the cell is coming over the telephone signal. Um, the the mountains uh, do obstruct, but people find a way on a regular basis of getting to a place where they can get the telephone signal. It's just a part of modern uh, life, at least in the areas where I am uh, of of communicating with the people with their relatives in town and, and things like that so there's there's a lot more communication and it's it's more complicated across languages across national borders maybe you've got two or three different political systems on a single river um, so it's very complicated but um, I'm convinced that it's that the context that with with these with social media with the uh, Facebook with what's up particularly in my Twitter does doesn't really uh, enter into here, but what's between WhatsApp and Facebook? I mean, you can get information everywhere in very, you know, just uh, with very little, with very little um, um, effort. And I also have, have met people virtually. In other words, there are people I've only met on, on, on social media that are people that think like, you know, are, have compatible thinking and they might, be from a different background. There's a woman that comes to mind who's a linguistics professor and she has a like mind. And so she's contributing ideas from her perspective in this platform. And so it just, it just so, this has so much potential uh, compared to the isolation that we had just 18 years ago. And again, I, I, I don't know more, I can't, can't suggest more for the Vietnamese or the, or the Chinese context except to appreciate that, you know, I think there are a lot of smartphones being sold in China now. Presumably they're talking to each other and um, how that can be used, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, we've gone over five minutes. I don't know if there's any, if there's anything, any other questions. Um, I did want to talk a bit, uh, Abiba. Yes. Go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you so much for your presentation. I, uh, I think I also related well with also a scenario in Malawi where we also have like uh, uh, some areas where there are flood prone areas and then the people were told to move to higher lands but then people have been like reluctant to move just because they were saying they are their ancestors, they buried their ancestors there so they cannot move and then leave their ancestors. So I felt like this is like uh, relating to uh, Malawi situation, but then I'm not so sure how best maybe should the government or maybe uh, the project implementers uh, handle such a situation whereby the project, maybe they look at the economic of a bit of the project to a larger population, it will benefit more people, but then it will disturb their social or livelihood of the people around uh, that place. How best would the government or handle that kind of situation? Because we understand on a large, uh, 
if you look at uh, a larger uh, area, um, a lot of people will benefit, but then there will still be a need for people to be moved or change their livelihood in one or the other. Over. Yes, again, again, it's, 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 it's fairly con contextual. In other words, Malawi has um, a very different context from other areas. Um, and and uh, close, not that close, but in, in, in your region, Ethiopia, just they just crowdfunded a dam. In other words, um, the government had decided not to do a dam and they have a local hero that is uh, crowdfunding this new dam. And there the problem is, of course, with Sudan and, e and Egypt that don't want Ethiopia damming the headwaters of the rivers on which they defend. So there are, there are different viewpoints uh, Ethiopia, it's a very popular decision to put in this dam. In the case of, in, in most cases around the world, it's something that the government is doing mainly to generate income for the government, okay? And then it is very, it is very common for them to paint a very rosy picture to the local people, okay? Um, this has happened back since they were building dams in the Tennessee Valley. Um, but now we are able to 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 communicate with each other and 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 uh, are, uh, try to argue and and at least get the best possible deal. At most, we can we can we can actually get the get the government to reconsider because in some cases, such as Bolivia, there are really good alternatives. It's not like there are no good alternatives. Um, I don't know with in the case of Malawi. Um, um, that what the costs uh, of the alternatives such as uh, such as solar and and um, and wind I know you'd have a huge uh, solar capacity um, again the government if it's decided it wants to build a dam it's going to underestimate the cost of building the demand and overestimate the cost of of alternative energy so you want to that's that's the importance of connecting with you know, through your social media, you connect with people whose lives are, are sur surround estimating the cost of energy and you get people like that into the discussion so that you're not just kind of having a, a one way conversation with with the government. You're 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 able to in that case, that would be another example of outside in help. Local people could ban could get could find out some uh, experts that know more about this subject and go into instant communication with them that's happened in bolivia i would think that you could aspire to do that in other countries dan um i realize we're over time but this issue of the dams i think it relates to every country that future generations is working in it's really a very timely thing um you know in afghanistan the helmon dam uh, transformed the agriculture down in baluchistan area and the future generations was involved in stopping a dam in Bundamir um, in Afghanistan. Of course, the Chinese, Vietnamese parallels. But I would just like to, to say in full transparency and confession, I am building a dam on the river behind my little mill here in Franklin. And I welcome comments and criticisms. Uh, I will not resist like the Bolivian government. So everybody, all my colleagues, please feel free to uh, criticize my small dam that is going to make electricity, I hope, on a sustainable basis. So please send your criticisms. Okay, folks, um, we've run uh, uh, a little over time. I will provide, we'll upload this, um, this video um, and I will provide the link very soon. I was gonna talk on uh, about how to access that information, but I will send an email uh, with the appropriate links for people that want to access this presentation and any previous uh, presentation. So uh, from uh, snowy, wintry Kansas, um, I, uh, I say goodbye to everybody and uh, we'll meet again in a month. If you have any suggestions for topics or, or people, uh, please let me know. Uh, write to me. Um, I, I, uh, I aim to have diversity um, um, and uh, we're thinking of, about how we can always try to improve 
this particular global forum. So uh, goodbye, and I look forward to getting uh, suggestions through the mail. Thanks, Dan. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.